Hello, everyone. We are, it is I, Dark Symphony 777, back with the fourth part of the fun, goofy OC tier list. I'm here with Meep again. And hi. Yes, he says, he says hi. Guten Tag. Um, and so we're just going to do, we're just going to get into it, as always. Like the video, subscribe to the channel, click on that bell for notification, leave it, your thoughts on the story. Uh, first off, you Tell may you notice... Adrian, name your firstborn child after him. Uh, <laughs> sacrifice your soul to, uh, I don't know, the Dark God Cthulhu. Whatever you feel like. I'm pretty sure we're, we're dealing with, like, Zoybird's Cthulhu, where he's, like, he's just a, just a random guy. He's like, no sure can't can think that's the power of Cthulhu. Uh, yeah, as you notice that I actually... Cthulhu. Yes. Cthulhu is repping for God. Um... I organized each each section based on like how they do. This time I actually like organized organized. So this one we're only gonna do one, two, three, four, five, six characters. So question: Do you want to do Exona first, or do you want to do Exona last? Uh, in terms of order, I'm going to go after what you suggest because I absolutely have no idea. All right, so we'll do we'll do the One Piece characters first because this is the whole reason. Because the whole reason I decided to do more than one video was because the author of these stories was like, I want to see what you hear about my story, my characters. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> <coughs> so let's see. So these are the five characters from the from Cardboard Hut's One Piece stories. Uh, I've been meaning to ask. I saw the title, the Straw Hats and the Iliad, and it was immediately like, "Okay, so I, I think I think that's actually wait, is it? That, I think that's actually how she. I think that's actually how she said uh, spelled it. What was that? Is that how she spelled it? No, it's oh no, no. I, 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 oh, I didn't even. I didn't even. Uh, spelling. Okay. All right, let me just fix that. I didn't realize. Yep, there we go. We fixed it. Yes. I fixed it. I fixed it. That's like probably one of the weirdest crossovers that I've seen. Like the Iliad. Oh no 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 no! It's actually it's actually not a crossover. It's just a pure One Piece story. It's just it, it's just it, it it just the island that it the area it takes place is like inspired by Greek mythology. Uh, so like a lot of you know like in, in One Piece, a lot of areas are inspired by like real world locations. Like uh, Dressrosa is in, is inspired by Spain. Uh, Marriage Wall is actually inspired by, is actually inspired by, I think, Greece. And then we had, um, uh, Skypea, which is, I think, inspired by, uh, like, the Tibetan area. So, yeah, a lot of, air, so this, this island is just inspired by, like, ancient Greece. So it's not a, it's not an actual crossover. She just happens to be a fan of those stuff. <clears throat> so let's see. And as as like a forewarning to cardboard, because I know you're gonna watch this, because I'm gonna send you this video. Uh, I'm not. There is one missing character, and that's Calypso. Uh, it's because he's gonna be in the. He's more important in the third story, and it kind of be. Wait, Calypso. His his full Wait, name is Cal no no. He's like he's like a swordsman, like a rival for Zoro in the story. He's introduced in the second story, but he's a more important character in the last story of the trilogy, which not done yet. So I'm leaving him off this list right now just because mm -hmm. i want to i want to wait until the third story is done before i actually put him anywhere okay so let's get the weakest one out of the way let's get region out of the way so he's a marine admiral uh, re marine rear admiral and he's basically the hydra <laughs> he's the, he's the hydra okay so he, he, he actually got like a devil fruit that allows him to turn into a Hydra. However, what happened was in the backstory, he actually tried to do a hostile takeover of the island of Ilium. And uh, this guy, King Cygnus, uh, used the power of Zeus to just sink, sink his ship, causing like his body to, as it's splitting into two heads as a Hydra, to go underwater and that left him scarred like permanently like his face is like partially cut in half i'm sorry did you mean the power of the divine lord anal 
No, 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 it, no. In this, in this, in this story, the gods are real. Like they're, but they're only like restricted to Ilium. Like so, like Zeus, Athena, Aphrodite, they're all real in this story, but they're only on this one island. <laughs> and I'll be like, is Zeus maybe one of my people? No, Zeus is like, huh? Well, I'll give you this item, but um, yeah, your wife's gonna die. <laughs> Yeah. The, the, okay. So here's the here's the most important question I have: Does Zeus turn into a swan or a bull? Um, interesting fact about that. Um, King Cygnus actually turns into a swan. <laughs> oh no, that's never a good thing. The yeah, there's. Time that happens, yeah, because in, in, in this race. in the second story, there's a character named Cersei. And her and her devil fruit basically allows her to turn people into animals. So she like, uh, show, I guess the, uh, I guess you since you never seen One Piece, like the closest comparison I have to her would be uh, Sugar, who was in Dressrosa, and her power was, oh, if she touches you, you turn into a toy, and everyone forgets about you. Also, you, you stop aging. <laughs> like, oh, oh okay. <laughs> but yeah, he's he's like the big bad of the second story. Uh, he basically wants revenge on uh, Helena's fault. Okay. Okay, yeah. uh, okay. So back to Regen. Uh, so yeah, his whole motivation is he basically wants to commit a hostile takeover of Ilium. Basically, or, or at the very least do a buster call. Uh, in the One Piece world, a buster call is something okay. that's basically... Does he have any deeper motivation than that? Um, he's essentially... Uh, it's connected to what I consider like the worst part of him. Like he's a good, in my review of this of Zoro's Odyssey, he was a good concept, but there wasn't any weight to back of his words, because all of his motivations were based around the fact that King Cygnus used the power of Zeus, struck down the lightning bolt, and left him physically disfigured. And, and I said, then along came Zeus. <clears throat> "Yeah, yeah, that's that's basically okay. it." Right. And I said, my if there's one thing I would absolutely fix, it would be to add that backstory in so his like his actions and his words carry more weight because it's like we have essentially half a character here. <laughs> we only we don't we don't he, what he's doing doesn't carry any meaning because the one part that would carry meaning is not in the story. Uh, cardboard Hort, cardboard hut did say that she was gonna add the back that specific backstory but i haven't reread zoro's odyssey so i don't know for sure if it's in there so it's it's basically it he's basically he wants to commit a buster claw which is basically like okay you see the island uh we're just basically gonna get a like a million ships around it and blow it up and make it basically make it never exist <laughs> I said that island. Oh, that that island never existed. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the issue I already have is like his motivation seems very bland and flat. I mean, just, I want to take over this island. Like, okay. Well, why? Do you care for the people? Do you? Just no, he doesn't care for the cool? people. Like, like he's like, supposed to be another example you... of like a corrupt marine. Like most of the marines in the One Piece world are actually kind of corrupt. Or, douche, or at the very least, douchebags. But this guy's corrupt through and through. So he just wants to be in charge. He just, want, like he just he wants to take what over Ilium to destroy it. Uh, why? Because, because of his because of what happened with again with Zeus with King Cygnus throwing the lightning bolt. He basically just want he just wants to kill everyone at the end of the day. So, all he wants to do is just kill everyone. Drunk. So, okay, here, here's 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 the problem that I that I see it. Like, he got struck down by the lightning bolts because he tried to take the island to destroy it. Correct. In the backstory, he wa he was ordered by the world government to take over the island because in this story, uh, the island manufactures what's called sea stone, and sea stone in the One Piece world. Is basically uh, ocean water, sol basically solidified ocean water. And people who have double fruits, they get weak 
when they touch the stone. It's basically like it's supposed to be like like a Superman and Kryptonite sort of thing. And so they okay. manufacture so Ilium manufactures the sea stone to give to the world government so they can create weapons to better contain uh, pirates who use uh, who use uh, devil fruits. And at the time, in supposedly in, as implied in the backstory, they started getting stingy with the sea prism stone. The world government didn't like that, and so ordered Regent to take over the island and t- so that way they can get access un un hesitantly to the sea stone. And that's in the past. In and that's in, <clears throat> that still leaves them like a very flat but functional character. Yeah, that's pretty. That's pretty much Regent. Like like I said, like oh, he would work better if we saw the backstory. So like we so like everything he does carries more weight. Mm. That was my main issue with that story. It's the fact that we didn't get that flashback. I, s- I still don't think have including the backstory of him trying to take over the island, being struck down by Zeus, and then wanting to take over the island to destroy it. Yeah, it's it would that compelling of a character. I know, but like we had weaker like One Piece had weaker characters. Like, they had weaker villains. Yeah, I don't care that one piece had weaker characters. I want a stronger one. Alright, then you'll probably like Doful Mingo. It's like, you <laughs> Like, do you, do you want to do, do the whole thing, how would you fix this? Like, um, I'm actually kind of curious. How, how would you fix Regen? Okay, that's a, that's a good question. Like, I mean... Greek stories are often are often signified by the uh, by the inherent weaknesses of man. Yeah, <coughs> and that's basically how he so, that's basically how he gets defeated again in this story. Like they Zoro, uh, General Hector, all of them have to actually drag uh, Region back into the ocean and drown him. So he actually, it's implied he actually dies at the end of the story by basically drowning. Mm. So he he's kind of he's kind of a bastard, right? Yeah, he's a bastard. How about you make how about you make it that the reason why he fails is not because is not because he got struck down by the thunderbolt. You make it you make it due to his own pride, and that allows him to be struck down by the thunderbolt. Like a uh, pride because uh, before the fall. Exactly. Like why? Why not make it? Why not make it so that he challenges the gods themselves? Well, you like, still, you would still, it would still have to be in the backstory. Gods... It would still have to be in the backstory. Yeah, I, I know, but but what I'm what I'm trying to what I'm trying to say is you inc- uh, you basically set up that he but that he is this sort of prideful character. Or if you want to, if you want to make it kind of like a tragedy, you make it. <coughs> you, you know, uh, let him arrive at the island and be like, "Okay, we want th- we want this to be a clean and quick takeover. As few civilian casualties as possible. We just want we just want to take over the production. We'll straighten this whole thing out, and then we're out of here. Like we'll leave like a minimal marine contingency, right? just just so this doesn't happen again. And then you have the island putting up resistance, and the more resistance that comes, the more he's like." Fuck! I don't want to. I don't want this fight. Like I'm a general. I could be leading way bigger assaults right here. Please, just let us take over. This is not supposed to be this difficult. And then he gets struck down by the thunderbolt, and that at that point he decides, like, okay, fuck it. I'm burning this whole. I'm burning this whole place to the ground. I, I like to. I like to hear what Cardboard Hut says about this. <laughs> I want her opinion. And then you, and then you show him being like. Uh, <clears throat> Like show traces of him like sparing people and stuff like that, basically being like, I don't really care for the civilians, but I don't want to hurt them either. But like as much uh, as longer as long as the fighting goes on and the people resist him, he starts losing his temper and he starts losing his patience. And with the Hydra, you can actually you can actually be like um, like show more of more of the injuries he can sustain more. And with each injury, like maybe his head cut, uh, getting cut off, he gets more and more angry and more and more, not just angry, mad. That's ac- just, that's ac- that's actually what happens. Mind. That actually, like every, they actually, they they, they imitate the, the the Hydra myth where they cut off the heads. It's like, you fool! That only makes you stronger. <laughs> no, no, I meant, I meant like, I meant like mentally. 
like every every head getting cut off just takes it takes off a bit of mercy takes bit of uh, takes with it a bit more of reason so by oh uh, okay like, we had like 10 10 heads and like every head just thinks slightly differently so every action becomes more erratic um i uh, no, i don't think that mm, maybe that that would work I mean, I mean, I'm trying. I'm like, I know they did something. Like, they did, they did the whole in in One Piece. They actually did the whole Hydra thing in canon with Orochi, but he was more of the he was more based off the Yamato no Orochi, where he had to actually behead him nine times in order to kill him, but he doesn't die, and it's, it's like, eh, not, I mean, no one really likes Orochi. <laughs> um, mm. so yeah, where would where would you put him? <clears throat> Very middle B tier. Very middle B tier. Yeah. I put I put him like near the near the top of C tier. That's where I put him. Because like he, here's here's my thinking. Like I don't think that a character who is flat but functional should be considered bad. He's not bad. Like I said, he's <laughs> like like I said, he's a good concept. He's just he's just not fully realized. That's why I put him in C. Like that's like, you you had you had things going for him. It's just, it's just the, the lack of a flat of backstory for him. A lack of a flashback to see what happened. That really holds him back. Yep. All right. So next one. Uh, let's do the king. Let's do the king. So, he's the king of Ilium. This one's gonna. This one's gonna be. This one's gonna be quick and to the point. He's basically an old man. His whole stick is he tends to forget where he is. Like he, so in One Piece, Zoro has like this habit of like always losing track of where he is. Like, like he always has like the worst sense of direction. Uh, King Cygnus is like that, but like older. <laughs> he's basically his character is he's a kind. He's basically a kind and just ruler. He's afraid of giving uh, his daughter Helena the the throne because he's. He's desperately afraid of what, how the gods will completely screw her over. Like the only god that actually likes Helena is Athena, and like the rest of them are just like, hey, "Fuck the bitch, <laughs> fuck her, <laughs> fuck her." And and the king does not want oh, her to. Don't. I know what that means in Greek mythology. No, don't fuck her. <laughs> no, don't fuck her. <laughs> no, don't fuck her. <laughs> You're right. Um, he also has a thing where he has like really long toes. And he uses that to pinch people's noses, like that's that's actually a, like a running gag he has. In, in the se- in the second story, that's how they Zoro's able to find out that uh, the Swan is King Cygnus when when the Swan just basically just <laughs> has him with his web toes and just pulls on him, like whack on. It's like oh great, it's the king. Wait, how are you a Swan? Whack. <laughs> uh... Like. <laughs> low or middle, like low high D tier, low uh, low C tier. Um, yeah, I would put I would I would put like lowish. Thankfully, the rest of the characters are pretty much, in my opinion, B tier or higher. Okay, so next up we have Dodgy Troy. <laughs> okay. So the first thing you need to know about Troy is he's kind of a tragic character. He's he's a tragic villain. He's the main antagonist of the first story, and his whole motivation is is pretty much the basis of Straw Hats and the Iliad and Helena's character. So Helena's character is she wants to marry, and she wants to marry someone worthy of getting the title as king, as ruler of Ilium with her. However, her father basically said, you must marry a swordsman. Except for Zoro. You cannot fight Zoro. <laughs> and she and she's like a really, really good swordswoman. And, ev- and nobody could beat her. No one could beat her, including Troy. Troy loved Helena. And he wanted to keep wanted to <clears throat> fall get her to marry him so bad but she was sim- he was simply not good enough to beat her in combat because that's the only way you can get her hand in marriage if you beat her in sword in in a in a sword and a sword fight 
So he went to the marine. He to take her hand in marriage, then you have to take her hand off. No, you just have to. You put just basically like, put it back on her arm. I, I guess so. Um, <laughs> and he basically goes to the marines because he's so desperate to learn new ta- tricks and try and get his hand. They gave him uh, a devil fruit called the ink ink fruit, which allows him to manipulate ink. Yeah, One Piece has a lot of weird powers. And so he uses that power to basically create a imaginary demon plaguing the entire island island Ilium that only that kills people at night and is afraid of light to to give this illusion that no one can leave the island. And so a big part and a big thing with his character once the straw hats get to the island is the fact he finds out that Helena lost to Zoro. And he really does not take that well. It's like, you, you got married? You, you beat her? You beat her? And so he, mani- he manipulates... Uh, yes. yeah. Maximum simpery. Maximum simpery, yeah. Um, he basically manipulates his father to basically act as like a decoy for him. Saying like, oh, yeah, it's this guy, my father. He's the, he's the, he's the guy who's... Who's take? Who's literally shrouded the entire island in shadow, and no one can leave. Kill him, <laughs> and so they beat him. Um, they found out at the end. They found out that the whole that he struck a deal with Ikayanu, I- who's basically one of the head marines of the Mar- of of the marines. He's basically like one of the, the big the big cheeses. Uh, it, we'll get we'll t- give you this devil fruit, and we'll teach you these skills. But when you beat Helena and you give your hand to marriage, you give the island to the Marines. So basically, like Regent, his ultimate plan is to ultimately give the island to the Marines. So that way they get they get access to the sea stone. Mm-hmm. And it's actually really cool how they actually how Zoro beats them. Like they have a very fourth wall breaking moment. Where, like, the final fight between Troy and Zoro and, like, Usopp and Sanji is like, hey, wait a minute. This is weird. It's like, how so, Sanji? It's like, oh, wait, how so, Usopp? It's like, doesn't, doesn't Luffy be the one to do all these final fight things? I think you're right. <laughs> like, poking fun at the, at, the, at, the, at the anime tropes where, like, the main character always gets, like, the final fight in the arc. They're like, no, it's Zoro's arc. Give it to him. He gets it. And yeah, I think I think he's a good character. Like I honestly think he's a well done, well rounded character. There's nothing really bad about him. Like there's literally nothing bad about him. There's things that he that maybe could have been done better. I mean, he was kind of a. I I think maybe they could have been more clever with how uh, how cardboard like port, like built him up. Like he could have been built up maybe a little bit better, but it's 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 really just a minor thing. So, so where would you put him? That's a good question. From what I, from what I can tell, there isn't really much to this character. The thing is, you you have to well understand that these characters, these characters kind of follow the One Piece logic. So they're. So very One Piece characters, and you and you wouldn't understand how exactly they work because you're not a fan of One Piece. Like, no, I, but, I, I, but I mean, like the the majority of this character is the relationship between him and this girl, and everything seems to be in service of her. So my biggest thing that I can't well gauge is how <clears throat> her uh, how his relationship to her is like. Set up and oh oh yeah she oh like oh that. oh I should have I should have mentioned yeah she basically friend zoned him <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah he he got sent to the friend zone mm. that uh, <laughs> I suppose that just makes I suppose that just makes it so that the character isn't really that interesting because like i mean he's a be- he's a better antagonist than regent because we he does have an arc he 
he has he has a pretty cool fight in the story with Zoro. Does he at least realize what he did was wrong? Yeah, he, he realized he realizes what at, at the end was wrong, and then he then he I think he actually just backs out of it. It's like, no, it's Zoro that's wrong. <laughs> Wait, am I really so out of touch? No, it's the protagonist that I'll It's the protagonist that's fault. <laughs> yeah, he pulls a skinner. <laughs> like we th uh, they like like at the end they think they got through him like once he loses and then he's like he has a realization and then he just completely loses it because he just like Nah nah it ain't really that's wrong. <laughs> I don't really I don't really see him being tragic, more, more like sad. Um, you know, the kind of sad where you're like, oh my, I feel so sorry for you. I kind of feel sad for you, like uh, Thanos and Gamora. Okay, like, okay, so we'll, do, well, he's not tragic. He's sad. I feel more, we'll do. He's, yeah, he's he's sad in the kind of way where you're like, uh, can you just please not? Just this isn't worth it. You're like the uh. The thing that I always want to say is like I want to I just want to push him out of the room and just like can you please go? You're making everyone in this room here sad. Can you go? Yeah, so I would put him I would put him mid B tier. Like really, I said there's high. Huh? Really, that high. Yeah, like I said, there's nothing really I mean if you want I can lower him a little bit more to like behind I'll put a, I'll put him behind uh, Celia. So he's a little lower I, in B tier, like mid B tier. I would I would put him I would put him bottom B high C tier, honestly. Because uh, the other guy sound like the the Hydra guy. I forget his name. Regent. He sounds way more tragic. Yeah, yeah. I think Regent sounds way better than him. All right, so I think it's just a matter of Troy was just written better. Like this, this you have to, you have to actually read the story to understand Troy. Like, yeah, I know, okay. but so, like, from, from the description, that's what we're going off with. Okay. General Hector, uh, Helena's right-hand man. <laughs> so, fun fact, uh, and spoilers about the ma uh, about the manga, uh, his power, his devil fruit is basically the wood wood fruit, allows him to, like, manipulate wood and stuff. They just introduced that, like, I think, like, chapter or two ago in the, ma in the manga with Ryo Kukuro. The green bull, and he's like a really, really deranged, ad, like psychopath. <laughs> and that's the, in One Piece. Oh God! No, General Hector's a nice guy. Oh. He, he's he's like a very oh. loyal to the fault to a fault guy for Helena. Like the whole like okay, so how how the story sets up in the beginning of Straw Hat in the Iliad is Helena and Hector managed to get away from Ilium. They don't know how, and it took a lot of planning, but they managed to barely get away from it, from the island. And it's a storm, and then they run into the Straw Hats. And he Hector C. Zoro's like, oh, I don't think uh, these are the Straw Hats. We shouldn't really be dealing with these guys. Because he knows about, he knows that Zoro's part of the crew, and it's like, um, yeah, we shouldn't be near these guys. <laughs> but Helena's, like, desperate because, like, she needs to, she needs to, like, she's, like, paranoid. <laughs> and so... They basically, the Straw Hats basically mess with her, and she pulls out a sea stone dagger and manages to land a hit on Luffy, and he just passes out. <laughs> just completely, like, they, they, they're they just laughing at her, and then she touches him with the dagger, and Luffy just, like, is out. <laughs> and then Hector manages to use his power to basically take control control their pirate ship and cry, and basically break it in half. Since fire ships are made of wood, like he, oh, it's like I control the ship now. Forgive <laughs> me for what I'm about to do. Yeah, that's what he does. He got and repairs only my powers. Yeah, uh, and they land in the ocean. They manage to get onto shore, and <coughs> Hector realizes that the, the straw hats are still alive. Somehow, it's like motherfucker. <laughs> Uh, and oh, so he br God. he basically brokers a deal with Luffy that if Hel if Zoro beats Helena, not only does then uh, they would be allowed to free passage off the ship. Like H Hector would be allowed to repair the ship and let them leave. Hector is completely like, uh, no, 
like, okay, okay, fine. But he has like his, his fingers crossed behind his back. Like, but actually, no. <laughs> You're pirates. You deserve to die. Takes his yeah, takes backsies. Like he, like he, big, he builds up a whole thing where he like repairs their ship. He brings up support. It's like, here, come get your supplies. And then he has all the troops with like sea stone tipped spears like surround us. Like, yeah, you think, you think. And then he basically decides to to kill him in the most like horrible way possible by <clears throat> by like hanging them as well as drowning them because the sea because. It's like, oh, what's the most humiliating way to, to kill someone with devil fruit? Bear, uh, drown them! <laughs> drown them in water! Burn, burn the witch! <laughs> I was expecting, like, a uh, user reference Monty Python. It's like, oh, it's like a newt. <laughs> but yeah, his whole character is, like, he's very loyal to Helena. Uh, he's very loyal to the kingdom of Ilium. He's a... He, he, he may sound bland on paper because loyalty is, like, all he has. But then over the course of the second story, we see he's actually a very vulnerable guy. Like, he's very... Like, he sees himself as a secondary father figure to Helena because uh, <clears throat> King Cygnus actually went to go talk to... Like, after the... the uh, apparently, after the flashback with Regent happened, he went to go confront the gods, but then he got lost on the island for, like, years <laughs> because he just couldn't find his way back to the city. And Hector basically took over as, like, a father figure to Helena. And so Helena sees him as a secondary father figure. He's very loyal to his... He's very passionate to his man. He's a consummary uh, general. Like, like once he realizes that the Straw Hats are serious, he's like, very well, I'll, I'll repair your ship again and let you leave this time. Uh, no, take back seat this time. <laughs> and, he, and he's basically the one who, like, does the father talk to Zoro at the end. He's like, if you hurt her... Hunt you. <laughs> mm. Yeah, it, yeah, he's a good character. Like, just like Troy, there's nothing inherently wrong with Hector. He's just one of those characters you have to actually read to un to fully like and understand. From what you told me, I would put him in like maybe high B tier. Yeah, he's like, actually... He's, he, he sounds functional. Yeah, he's very functional. Like, there's... Like, just like Troy, there's nothing really wrong with him. In fact, there's actually no flaws with him. I wouldn't... I I would say there's nothing wrong with him as a character. Like, absolutely nothing. Like, the only thing... The only thing that I could think of that you could include to improve him is add dimensions to him. Yeah, they do. It's just I, I, I honestly forgot what those dimensions were. <laughs> Oh wait, he d he gets like completely de depressed when uh when uh the Marines do like a uh a a like smear campaign on the on the Straw Hat saying basically sending letters to to Ilium saying that Zoro died. Like aha, he's dead, and it's like oh no. <laughs> but uh, Helena gets hit by it worse. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just spitballing here, but what could be a cool idea is that he maybe wants to inherit the throne. Like not in a, he, not he does, in a he does have, he does game. actually like, have a right to, the, he does actually have a right to the throne, but only, but only if Helena and the king pass away. He's, te he's technically third in command. So if they, if they pass away, then he technically yeah. inherits the throne. At least until like Hel Helena and Zoro's kids get of age. Is that is that actually is that uh, ever brought up that he's like I uh, I could rule the kingdom and I think I would be a great big leader but I think yes that's that's uh, I, I think that is so I, have to basically set I believe that is actually like, brought up sure in the second she story the that she can be. Is that, is that yeah I that think that's I story? think that is a plot point in the second story because in the second story Helena is like so despondent and with Cygnus missing again. He basically offers to take over, to basically willingly take over the kingdom until, like, until she gets over, until she finishes grieving. Because, uh, in the story, in the, in the time skip between the first story and the second story, Helena had two kids with Zoro. One of them died in, uh, in, like, a, as a, as a newborn. And she, and she was able, barely able to get over that grief when she, 
when the propaganda from the world government showed up saying that Zoro died and she's just completely completely breaking down over the first half of the story and and Hector actually offers to take I believe he t offers to basically take the throne in her place until she get until she's able to properly grieve But yeah, Hector does technically have a right to a throne. He just he just thinks he doesn't he doesn't deserve it at this moment because he he, he sees Helena as a daughter and he wants to see her succeed. Yeah, I think he's just pretty solid. So yeah. All right, now we get to the the star of the show, <laughs> Hel Helena. Oh oh boy. She's a good character. I really love her. I'm not. I'm just gonna spoil it and just put her right, right there next to Valkyrie. She's a phenomenal character. Okay, so convince me. Okay, so okay, you know that dumb stereotype about strong, independent females. Like, ha she. This is a strong. Fear her. Yeah, she's been. Oh boy, do I ever. She's this done right. She's Katara. Yes, Katara. she's like Katara. Or if you want, you can be like Azula. Because Azula is kind of a strong, oh, independent no. woman who don't need no man. Except Helena wants a man. She desperate. She wants to prove that she's the strongest swords swordswoman in the world. Because that's actually a big part of Zoro's character in One Piece. He wants to be the world's greatest uh, swordsman. Except the title is currently held by a man by the name of Draco Mihawk. Who's really, really powerful. Like, we just got his bounty in the One Piece manga. And he's like over 3 billion. It's like nearly 3.2 billion. Like, he currently has the second largest bounty. And apparently he's even offered the title of Warlord of um, Emperor of the Sea. And he's like, nah, I don't want that. <laughs> I don't want that title. <laughs> I could I could get it if I wanted to, but I don't want it. <laughs> so Helena basically spent like a long time of her childhood studying the blade. And she even offered like a learned a really weird technique where she fights with uh, in a rapier style, but two she has two rapiers used by her feet. She basically wields two swords by with her feet. Uh, yeah, two two in the hand, two two in the feet, and she and she's able to like use all four professionally. Okay. I mean that's not that's not out of place in One Piece because we have Zoro who literally has a sword in his mouth like yeah, whenever he fights. I just imagine, I just imagine her running at you with like swords in her feet, and I, haha, you didn't expect my feet, Yeah, yeah, that's that's true. Um, when we're first introduced to her, she she wants to be taken seriously as a character, hence why, hence why she really doesn't like, uh, she doesn't heed Hector's warning to leave the Straw Hats alone, because they're just because Luffy's just messing with her, and she's just not, she really doesn't like the fact they're just basically mocking her. <laughs> And then she basically takes out like half the crew by herself with like a small dagger because it has, because it has uh its uh, sea stone in it. And then she realizes that Zoro. Uh, and then during the rematch between her and Zoro, when Zoro beats her, she basically willing. It's like, all right, you're married to me now. And everyone's like, what? Just what? <laughs> I'm sorry, what? <laughs> And then, uh, I don't think that they're compatible, or else that would have been really awkward. Yeah. And so, <coughs> then there is a ca uh, cave in. Imagine like being married to someone, and then suddenly it turns out like maybe they like the prequel trilogy. Yeah, that that divorced. gets that's it. Uh, and then there's a cave in that separates Helena oh. and Zoro from everyone else. And so then we finally get to see Helena as like a fully fledged character during that moment. She's actually kind of goofy. She's over, she's actually pretty over the top. She's actually she's headstrong like Zoro. She's stubborn like him. Uh, she has the same dream as him as being the world's strongest uh, swordsman. 
But she eventually willingly gives that up because she realizes that Zoro has a better drive for it. And basically, like, I want you to earn that title so that way you can be the greatest king that Ilium has ever seen. Go earn that title! <laughs> and she's just... She... Uh, yeah. Like, they... Like, even when they leave out... Night, woman. It says world's greatest swords man, not greatest swords person. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but she she does have a lot of cool moments and very hilarious moments. Like, there's a moment where it turns out she can't hold her liquor. Like, a pair, a, like I kid you not, apparently as like a running theme, like whenever she like apparently drinks alcohol, they actually trade out the alcohol with fruit with uh with fruit punch or like tomato juice, like any red cutter liquid they can they can get their hands on. And when she does find out about it and she does drink alcohol, she only takes a sip and she destroys like several blocks because she just can't handle her liquor. And there's an entire chapter where they literally have to restrain her long enough for, for her body to just expel the, the alcohol. <laughs> and then they found out it's even worse when her mother gets, apparently she got that from her mother. And when she got drunk, she destroyed the like half the island, like in a drunken stupor. Like, <laughs> and she and she she constantly makes things. I can hold my liquor. I can hold it. <laughs> and there's like, sure you can. Here, have some tomato juice. No, it's alcohol. Yeah, I mean, yes, it's it's red wine. Thank you. You're <laughs> fruity. It's basically drunk driving without the driving. Yes, she's basically a drunk driver without the driving. Like she even has these cool moves, like. And every time when she try, does one of these moves, she always kind of inadvertently sets her feet on fire because she moves so fast. And she, she, she has a lot of cool chemistry with Zoro. Like you, you, she's a really amazing character, and I just really loved her. Like when I read Straw Hats in the Iliad, I said without hesitation, Helena was basically the best part of the story. There's no hesitation. I wouldn't call her that good just from what you told me she sounds very i mean she sounds she sounds fine but like that's guess, that's just her and in, 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 like their best that's just her in the first story hmm? that's just her in the first story like in the second story she's hiding I mean, to me, to me, to... she's like hiding her kid and she's like completely depressed it because sounds like you have that much time with her so her being like uh, endearing to her and basically just having that much development seems like a given, but I don't think that makes her great. I just think she has like a lot of time devoted to her. She does. It, she is. She's she's the you know I mean? she's like this. She's like one of the two main characters along with Zoro in both stories. Yeah, exactly. I still think she's a great character. I'm not. I'm not moving her. This is my oh, opinion. This is my I opinion. Where? Okay. Where? Opinion. Where would you put her? Low A tier. Below A tier. So below Bert uh, Bur Low to mid A tier. Low to mid. Uh, okay. All right. That's your. That's that's your opinion. That is. Your, that is. To, to quote Barrett from Team Four Star, that is an opinion you are having. That is an opinion you are having. Yes. Okay. And the final character we have for this video is Exona. Oh, oh boy. Oh boy. I'm. Oh, if you thought Harry Potter and Metroid crossing over was really weird, um, wait until you see what this is a crossover of. Yes. Okay. So. Exona is from a story that is a crossover between a TV show called Bones. Uh, first off, do you know what Bones is? Uh, I know it's it's like it's like one of those it's like one of those mid two thousands crime shows. It, it was it was like two thousands. It was yes, it it was like two thousands. I think it I think it started in two thousand. I think it started in two thousand seven. And I know. I don't know. Um, the, Bo Bones, uh, Bones is based off a book series, and the book series was was based off 
uh, a real life person. So basically, the book is like fictionalized versions of this real person's actual cases. And the show just basically loosely adapted those. Yeah. Where, it's, where, where they solve crimes by investigating the, the bones of the dead. Yes. Okay. So that's not the weird part. The weird part is what it crosses over with. Oh, boy. Here it's, we go. it's crossed over with a sort of uh, forum, fan forum thing called Philaria. What? Yes, Philaria. I. What is. What is that? What. Philaria. Philaria is like. It, okay, so you know the S. You know how. You know this SCP is like a website, right? Yeah. Yeah, Philaria is the same thing. Except instead of horror and like. Like weird stuff, Philaria is all about. Um, of war. Yeah, you're that's that's it's that's about? it's about war. It's a four website. It's for four affiliates. Uh, yeah, his his bra his brain his his brain broke. His brain broke. Uh, I swear to God, I never heard of that before I read this story. I swear to God. <clears throat> so, okay. So, a little info about Philaria. So, Philaria is this sort of interdimensional island. That's basically mostly a gigantic forest and mountain range. That's occupied by, like, at the very smallest, 60 feet tall men and women. Like, Nagas, Driders, Giants, Fairies. And their whole thing is they eat, they eat smaller people who kind of get swept up into the world. Because various yeah, reasons, like, just... like, greed or emigration, they, they'll find them and then these people will eat them. Fuck, what does that remind me of? That remind. Uh, I, I recently watched something. I forget what it was. My memory kind of purged itself of it. But I watched it and just thought, this is the writer's barely disguised fetish. <laughs> um, are you thinking of... Uh, I think I know what you're thinking of. <coughs> what? It's on the tip of my tongue. I can't remember it either. <laughs> I think it was an anime or something. Um, it, it might be? I don't know. Uh, but yeah, there's actually an in-lore reason why they eat people. Oh, I know, I know, I what know, it? I know what it was. I remember, I remember. What was it? It was, uh, do you watch Elvis the Alien? No, never heard of it. He, he made it, he made a, he made a video on Trumpy and the Girls. That's just that's just basically fairly disguised war fetish. Yeah, but this okay. So like I said, uh, there's actually an in lore reason why the war happens. Because according to the lore, uh, it's act. I'm just thinking it reminds me a lot of Attack on Titan. Yeah, I, I guess so. Um, in the lore, uh, they reveal that. That to these giants, to these lamias, right? uh, eating smaller humans is actually the healthiest thing to them. What? Yeah, in in, in Philaria. Yeah, yeah. So they so they eat this not because of like pleasure or anything. Some some apparently do. Some of them get a kick out of it. Some of them do it to like torture humans and make them repent. Some actually try and go out of their way to either protect humans or refuse to eat them, like vegetarian style. Uh, but for the most part, they eat this because it's it's literally the only thing that can actually sustain them for a long while. It's what? They it, it sustain it sustains them the most. So they eat, so for the most part, they eat them not because they want to, but more they because they have to. What? 
they eat. Can you hear me? Like your connection is really bad right now. <laughs> yeah, I'm running on like I'm running on like hotspot because I'm in my car. And it's hot in here. Hmm. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. So yeah, they they eat the they eat the smaller people not because they want to, but more because they have to. Okay. And Proceed, continue. Okay, so Exona's character is, she sees the horror of this. She sees the whole, Exona is a fairy, so she can actually grow and eat people too, she just chooses not to. And her whole character is, she sees the horror of these, like these, she sees these small people wanting to live, wanting to survive, and because of how, just how the island functions, like to the point where even the gods will like get involved if someone tries to sway the rights, sway the the equal, the, um, the uh, environment and ecosystem too much, they'll literally hard reset it. And Exona basically wants to reverse the, uh, the, the pecking order. She wants to hu- the small humans in charge and hunting and killing the big, gigantic lo- uh, eaters. Oh, okay, That's- so where does the key show bones come in until all this okay so okay so the plot is we're introduced to a character named jora who actually studies a who actually goes to a lecture by temperance bones and she ends up in falaria sometime in the future as a giant and one day while they're looking through they're just wandering through the forest they come across a skeleton of a fairy and er- and literally everyone who watches, from the fairies to Jora to everyone, completely freaks out because they're just they never seen a skeleton before. Because in Falaria, people don't really die; they they become like the peak of their body, the body they can handle. They they stop aging more or less, and the only way people actually die in that world is by getting eaten. And so, to them, seeing a skeleton is completely. Just, co- just, just like breaks their mind and breaks like their logic because they never, they're so used to how Galaria works that they never see, they never understood anything like it. And so Jara, uh, with the help of some of her friends, basically makes a gets a portal, gets it to the uh, links it to the Jeffersonian, and then kidnaps Bones and her entire crew to to Falaria. It's like we need your help. Like you please come with us. Like no, you're kidnapping us! Please, no! We're doing it. We're we're taking you anyway. No! And they basically like the uh, like the very first thing they see when they when they're kind of shoved into Falaria is like a gigantic fairy swooping down from the sky and just starting to gobble up humans. And she's like, and like Jora and the rest of them are like looking at the fairies like, dude, too soon. And I'm like, sorry, I was hungry. And like Bones and her team are like completely just freaked out. It's like we want to go home. It's like we, we need your help. We need your help to study this skeleton of a fairy and, and to solve it. And Exona's with them at first. And basically, she's the one who do manage to get like all the tech, all the technology and all their equipment into Falaria and set up in this gigantic tree. And they slowly mm. kind of piece together what happened, and they found out. That the fairy was killed by Exona because the fairy because Exona was creating this sort of like large army of like small humans and fairies and lamias and driders to basically reverse the di- what they call the dynamic equilibrium and basically forcibly invert the entire ecosystem and make it so that that the, the big things are basically like disgusted with eating humans and are willing to like fight the gods themselves and take over them to, to ensure that this thing happens. Okay. Yeah, she, so it, it's actually really cool how they caught her because they realized, well, the person who did that studied uh, had ice magic. But we tested everyone who had ice magic and no one matched up. And then uh, Booth had an idea. It's like, wait a minute, we never, we never tested Exona. And so what happened is Boo uh, uh, Bones actually starts a conversation with uh, Exona trying to weasel her out of it, and then she ducks, and Boo throws like a bunch of knives at Exona's face, and she and she instinctively freezes them, 
And she's like, oops, I got caught. <laughs> It was you all along, wasn't it? Yeah, it was you, and then she reveals that she's like basically like an egomaniac who who basically wants to do all these things because she wants to like invert the the envir- uh, the environment and basically forcibly take over everything. And they basically compare it to like a um a so a socialist dictator sort of thing who actually does that in the story, saying that uh, sooner or later you, you're always. People like you, you're always going to go mad with power. You're going to start killing people. And uh, you're going to get taken down. And she's like, no, I'm not. Because I because I work smarter, not harder. <laughs> we must redistribute the means of eating. No, nah, yeah. She, she basically wants to do that. More or less. <laughs> and she's like, like once she, she becomes a great... Anta- like, once she realizes she's an antagonist, like, the first thing she does is... Is they ba- she basically kills quote unquote like the face of Falaria her a-, a Lamia named Crisis who is one of those Lamias who eats for pleasure like she'll eat to eat but she also eats like hee <laughs> hee and basically gets like a gigantic sword and like stabs in her in her chest in her stomach and basically sets like a gigantic two hundred foot tall plus tree on fire and they all have to like hide out and basically commit girl warfare. Just to be able to beat her, and they basically they yeah. basically beat her by like basically general wear and tear. Like they had an entire strike force of just fire based uh, uh, lamias and uh, a fire harpy and stuff like that to basically go round robin and basically just wear her down like over and over t- over again. So just like a grudge match. Yeah, like a grudge match. Alright, sounds fine, kind of. Yeah, the, like, she, there, there is one issue with Exona, is like, her character is kind of predicated on the fact that she was, like, she she would slowly fall on these, like, as Boots say, she would slowly start to kill on people, do all these things, but she never does. So that kind of leaves her somewhat toothless. Like, you can't, you can't take her that seriously because she's not going out of the way. Despite over the course of the story, there's tons of opportunities to just have her kill someone. I said my only my only thing I would change is have her kill someone. Just anyone. It could even be like a random no-name fairy. Just have her kill one person and that's it. But every there is like six, seven chances for her to kill someone and she never goes through with it. Hmm. And I think that's just a massive, that was like a minor disappointment. <coughs> so you wanted her to be more evil. I want, no. Uh, what I wanted is, I, it's just her character was built up as basically falling for what Booth said was going to happen. Like, a re- history repeating. Like, she doesn't, she's so sure that what's going to happen, like her killing people, her going over the deep end. Has, is not going to happen. But she goes over the deep end, but she doesn't kill a single person. Despite the fact mm. it it would make the absolute most sense for her character to kill someone. Okay. Yeah. Like that, that is literally my only flaw with Exxon. It's like, you're given all these chances to kill someone. Like, you don't have to kill a bunch of people. At the very minimum, just kill one person. That's that's it. It can just be it can just be a random fairy, a random lami, a random human. It could just be anyone. But she doesn't. <laughs> like even the even the skeleton that they find wasn't killed by her, it was killed by someone else. And she yeah. So she doesn't even kill the per- the person, the whole reason why Bones is there in the first place. She doesn't even kill him. Hmm. Yeah, I agree. She should kill people. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so not much to it. Yeah. So where would you put her? Uh. Um. Since I am so unfamiliar with like. Everything about it, let's just go middle C here. It's, I think, the safest bet. Um, 
yeah, you you did that. I put her at bottom of this tier. Like I said, her only that the the thing is everything except for the killing thing is so strong is is such a really good dedicated character discussion on on these types of characters, like the whole dictator type character. I just I just really think she should have just killed someone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's one of those characters you need to read the story to do. And trust yeah. me when I say dynamic equilibrium is not an easy story to get through because there's just a lot of techno babble involved with it. Yeah, I I, I trust you. I trust you that uh, maybe she's good, but like from everything I I heard. Yeah, that's fine. Just... Yeah, you, you, like like I said, you you have your opinion. Like this is your opinion. I like, can't really, I can't really gauge it. Yeah, you can't really gauge it because even then you're probably gonna get turned off by like the boar. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Thankfully, thankfully there's no like sex or anything, and they don't even treat boar as like a sexual thing. They treat it as like a survival thing. There's like tons of nudity in the story though. Mm. Yeah. Like most salamias are pretty much just topless. So it's like, oh, that's a that's that's like a, a hundred foot tall boobs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and they and they literally ask like all the crises like, uh, to keep the men from getting distracted, can everyone just wear just not wear wear like clothing, <laughs> like around their chest mostly. Uh, um. Stupid. Yeah. So that's 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 what I want to talk about. I guess that's the end of the video. Okay. I am completely covered in sweat. I'm going to go inside my house. And I will see you another time, everyone. Yeah, he's he's here as always. We'll see you next time. And cut. Good boy.